as a means to transform nations. Um, and you will, um, I hope, uh, you will find it enlightening to see what I also found very enlightening. And I was really amazed at what, what we, we have had here in the, in the past in Germany, where the cooperative movement comes from. And then I would like to add a second uh, glimpse at um, a concept in Korea. And, and you will, at the end, you will see why that is, why I connect these two, because they have an overlap in, um, in a lot of um, uh, impulses that they can give us. So we'll also look at Canaan Farmer School in Korea uh, and the second part. So let me start by introducing you to this sir. This is Mr. Wilhelm Reifeisen. Uh, this is uh, the founder and the, the idea giver of the cooperative movement. And what we are gonna look at today is actually only the tip of the iceberg. So I'm only going to give you a very little bit of an insight into what is um, what has happened in the cooperative movement. And it goes back actually 200 years. Um, and there are currently, um, it's, we, we are living in time of rebirth of cooperative movements globally. There are um, cooperatives being started in Germany, in Switzerland, in many, many countries in the hundreds every month. Why is that? And uh, what does that mean for us? And why could it be interesting even for the Europeans in this call um, today? Uh, this is what I hope we will see after the call. So I will focus a little bit on this man, Friedrich Wilhelm Reifeisen, who lived from 1818 to 1888. <laughs> Excuse me. Who is... Mm, very close to what we want to see with the third education revolution. Um, Tools and Transformation is the organization call that I have been working for and I'm um, chair of the supervisory board now. And what we aim to do uh, this, with this organization is a education revolution, a third education revolution. And there is a book out that has that same title. You can find it on Amazon, you can find um, a website that's called thirdeducationrevolution.com uh, where you find the basic ideas. I've written a chapter in that book and I've co-edited it with uh, Dr. Vishal Mangalwadi, an Indian, who many of you probably know or at least have heard of. So start with Raiffeisen. Who, who was Raiffeisen anyway? Most people in Germany who know a little bit about um, uh, Raiffeisen don't really know that he was a Christian. So they know that he started the cooperative movement and they know that he is a historical figure coming from central Germany, uh, but they don't really know that he was a Christian. He may not have been an evangelical or a Pentecostal or a charismatic in any uh, closer sense, but um, from his writings, which I have read, you can clearly see that he was very well biblically educated. He knew the Bible. Um, he knew um, the Old and the New Testament. He knew the Gospels. And he cites and quotes the Bible in a lot of his writings. So, and you will see also when he, when he defines standards for what is a cooperative and how will it work, you will see that he has been using a lot of biblical principles in yeah. these, that model of, of, um, of business, actually. His aim was to uh, was more than making money and food available his aim was to transform society so he suffered under the situation that the poor in his time uh, were in there is a lot of sources available about him and from him you can even read original uh, writings most people only read secondary literature which is literature talking about someone but then there is what we call primary sources and primary sources are things that the person we're talking about himself has written. And I think we should be primary source readers more than secondary source readers. You understand that? Because that will give you not the interpretation of someone of what this person thinks, but it will give you what he really thought and said himself. So I think we should be primary source readers. Okay. So how did this all start and why did it all start? And what does that have to do with us? The thing is, interestingly, um, in the time of Raiffeisen in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, 
We're farming uh, on small plots, just as they are uh, in many of your countries. And very little or no technology. I think Josh to turn off his microphone. Thank you. Um, so the situation was the same as in many of your countries. Farmers farming on small plots with little or no technology, they had no bargaining power because they only had small production quantities. So they couldn't go up to the to the to the big uh, seed seller and could say, okay, let's uh, I'll buy um, you know two thousand kilograms or ton uh, two tons of your uh, seed if you give me a better price. Every single um, farmer had to walk up and buy his little package. Uh, and so there was no bargaining power. They could not say, give me a better price because I buy a lot. That that's a pro was a problem. And that I am, um, and saw that, understood that. At the same time, we had a very, very bad usury banking, which also is the case in a lot of African countries as I've seen. So uh, you have extremely high um, interest rates of the banks. Um, I, I, you know, I've seen in Africa, I've seen interest rates between 10 and um, uh, up to 20% and even more, um, which, is, which is not really good um, because it drives you into a vicious cycle of debt and more debt. So you need money in order to, to get this farm to keep it running. And then because the, the interest rate is so high, you have to go even higher, you have to take more money, uh, up, more loans, and then the, 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 the interest rates kills you even more. And that this is a cycle of debt and more debt that people got into and were not able to get out of. And I think that corresponds with a lot of your situations, because if you want to loan, make a loan from a bank, uh, you may have very high interest rates. At the same time, and then the situation from back then into today's situation, um, there was limited access to financial services, um, and there is actually for a lot of you limited access to um, financial services in the emerging and developing countries. The the other problem that 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 it makes um, growth of businesses in Africa um, pr problematic is that the markets increasingly increasingly have become globally oriented, which makes it hard for small farmers to become part of the system. Because if you only have a small amount of, of crop, you will never become part of the, the big system. So when let's say a, a big, let's say Walmart uh, is looking for a business partner who is providing uh, wheat uh, in Africa or crop um, or, um, uh, any other crop, they will try to find someone who is able to provide a lot of um, uh, a, a large amount of that crop. So, and and that makes it hard for you to get into that cycle of of uh, business when you only have your little piece of land. The second, the third thing is technologies are complex and alter rapidly. So, what that means is um, when you want to keep up with um, with uh, efficiency in your farming and in making money, you will have to, to use technologies. But technology is changing so quickly that you need to be able to invest money into the changing technological um, requirements that, that you will find in order to be uh, efficient, cost efficient, and, and really make money. Food and agriculture supply chains are fragmented. That means you cannot necessarily depend on long-term contracts because the um, the buyer will quickly switch when he finds um, the material he needs somewhere else a little cheaper so um, and then you have the problem as we've seen now with um, um, the, the, the supply chains that, that are fragmented now because of the wars that we have in Ukraine in Israel in other many other parts of the world so that leads to a problem. Um, what Raiffeisen developed then is two different types of cooperative thinking. One was the agriculture cooperatives, and there is of course more than these two. 
Uh, there's a lot of them. Um, and these are just the two that I want to, you know, focus a little bit on. Agriculture cooperatives and cooperative banking. These are the two types of cooperatives that Reifeisen focused on and that were helpful for at his time. Um, he lived in the countryside where farming was hard work and brought little income um, and little effect. Um, and then what happened was um, they had a what they call a hunger winter in 1846-47, where a lot of people uh, that, that had little um, were dying uh, of poverty and of hunger. Um, so he saw that and he was the mayor of a small town. He thought, what can I do? So what he did is he started an initiative and asked the wealthy uh, to found a cooperative association that started a bakery. Uh, because he said, it, it's, not, it's not good that a farmer needs to finance the, the large profit margins of a baker. Because what happens when you have uh, a shortage of things, that prices go up. So when it was a hunger winter, so everybody needed bread and wheat was expensive. So those people that did not have money were not able to, to buy food, to buy bread anymore. So what he did is he said, okay, we will, we will um, not give in to this vicious cycle of negative um, consequences for the, for the poor. And we will, uh, I'm asking the wealthy of the, of the city to, to put money into a pot. And that pot was not given away, but it was used to buy wheat at, uh, at well bargain prices and then to produce uh, bread uh, in a bakery that was sold at a non um, a, a, a not extremely high um, um, uh, profit margin. So that led to the fact that people were able to, to pay for bread. So a lot of people survived because they were able to, uh, to pay for bread that they needed. And then what, uh, when he saw that this worked well, he continued and and, and um, started buying seedlings in the in the spring of 1847, and he bought wheat and potato seedlings so the farmers could um, start um, with these seedlings uh, to get wheat and potato uh, uh, crop growing. Um, because the problem, as in the winter happened, everything was so expensive that the the bargaining power of this bigger group, the cooperative procurement of seedlings, uh, of seed and seedlings was what made the prices affordable. So the, he started having first experiences with, okay, what can we achieve when we, be, when we come together and, and negotiate and bargain for good prices in a group? So that was the first thing that he understood that really works well. In the next phase, in 1849, he saw that, um, okay, this, uh, this system that he was using here in, um, um, in the hunger winter and in the spring 1847 did not really carry them very far. So he, he saw that um, the problem then, the other problem that they still had in 1849 was that the banking was, was so bad that, you know, when... A farmer wanted to expand or to survive, he needed to buy a cow. And to buy a cow, he needed to take up money from the bank. But then what happens when, uh, when you have that cow and you sell milk and, and uh, you start producing you know, uh, cheese and stuff, and what, what then happened is that the interest rates took away all that he, he made off of that cow. So there was no chance that this farmer could ever get out of that circle of, of usury banking. So what he did is he said, okay, we will have, we will start something like a, a money, a money pot, a shared money pot where the wealthy of the city uh, can put money in uh, with a solidary unlimited liability, 60 of the wealthy citizens. And then the cooperative could borrow large money amounts um, from other banks. So they, they grew the amount of money that they could uh, give away as loans to farmers by, by building a strong base. So this money was not given away. This money was just used to, to, to grow uh, the base of money that they were able to, to then give away to the farmers. Uh, and the farmers then could could repay 
these loans in a long-term plan with low interest rates. Um, and that made it possible for them to grow uh, their farms and to sustain their families and uh, to, to, have, to, to make a living. So what you have here is, you know, the, these steps is what Raiffeisen identified as, okay, this really works and this really helps people um, so, in, and that, that was the focus then that Raiffeisen grew um, in the first years. He started what, he, what we now today call cooperative banking um, as one of the main um, things he, he knew he needed to fight. He needed to fight these high interest rate banks that were killing the farmers and that were killing um, even entrepreneurship and, and businesses growing up, which at the end of the day not only helped a farmer, but it also helped, um, you know, those people that were working for the farm who also could make a living all of a sudden. And other people, you know, the industries that, that were supporting of the farmers also could grow. So it, it created an, an impact even beyond the farmers that because then people could buy, people could sell, the, the businesses were growing. So things developed in a, in a good direction, he saw. So let me let me quickly go a little bit over what is what is the idea behind what Raiffeisen started here. Um, what is his um, what is his option as opposed to the other options that you could theoretically think of how to alleviate this problem of usury banking and so. So what happens is Raiffeisen's path is an alternative to these five unhealthy approaches to alleviate poverty. The first, in my view, unhealthy approach to alleviate poverty is charity donations, handouts, help. So um, I've seen this hundreds and hundreds of times that, you know, uh, and this is not only for Africa, this is for everybody that at the end of the day, even in the Western countries, giving people money in the sense of, you know, um, beyond I'm not talking about disaster relief. So when you have an earthquake uh, or a natural, a, a natural um, um, something that really hit a, a large amount of people um, that, that killed a lot of people, that destroyed homes, or that say a war uh, destroyed a whole country, th these are different situations. I'm talking about the, the not in war, not in, extreme nature, uh, natural uh, situations. Um, so if you then, as the standard implement charity model, what that leads to, it's, I call it infantilization. You know what that means? Infantilization is basically keeping you a kid forever, making you a kid that's dependent on handouts forever. And that's not what we want and that's not what we should do uh, because I think it keeps people dependent on help forever uh, and it does not challenge them to grow and it does not give them the dignity that the biblical, um, the biblical view of man is, is giving us. So um, it makes people kids for all of their lives and that's not what we want. The second option that's not a good option in my eyes is, and what's happening right now, dependency of superpowers like China who give us loans and which then when they cannot be paid back, create control. So what we have a lot happening in Africa currently is that China gives loans or China does, and this is only one example, it's also other nations who do this and other you know, organizations and companies um, who are not really interested in, in long-term sustainable growth of businesses and entrepreneurship in the nations they basically want control. And so what they use to get control is that they know that you need something that you cannot pay right now. I've seen it in Uganda and Kenya and Malawi. I've not seen it, but I've seen it in Congo and others where Chinese build railroad, they build airports, they build uh, ports, um, so sea ports. And then, and they just wait until the nation or the, the, the uh, builder cannot pay their uh, monthly or yearly rates. And then they go and say, well, that's not a problem. You can just, you know, you can just give us the airport. We will control the airport and, and uh, that's fine. Um, don't worry. 
uh, pay back later. Uh, what that leads to is when you, when I landed in Kampala last time I did in, in Uganda, you, you enter the airport and everything you see is written in Chinese letters. Global airport has Chinese all over. You have to look for, uh, you have to look for, um, you know, Ugandan um, text, uh, hard to find. So what that, what that does is it, it leads to dependency and control by other superpowers or by super companies, which we don't want. Um, so these loans are basically the same thing that Raiffeisen had as a problem back then with the usury loans, it's dependency and control. The third option that we don't really want is state intervention through tax finance subsidies. Uh, a lot of the Western nations currently have this, have this uh, system that the state goes into the business development phase uh, or into the profitable business and have, puts tax finance subsidies into the business market. That's not really a long-term effective solution because it, it creates other dependencies and other control mechanisms that make you, um, uh, you, you can be attacked by them. You can be controlled by them. You don't want that really because it leads to the fact that taxes need to be rising because the money the, that the state will give away in subsidies needs to be generated by taxes because the state himself does not earn any money. It doesn't produce anything. So he goes and raises the taxes. So at the end of the day, everybody pays for this. This is not really helpful also. Fourth option, you could say, okay, let's just uh, try the communist Marxist overthrow of basic structure of society and make everyone owner of everything. And actually I've seen that idea uh, grow a lot in Africa over the last years. I've seen a lot of people take on this, 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 this theory of um, you know the rich need to be taken away everything, and we if we spread um, the ownership of everything to everybody, uh, everyone will have something. But that is a, in my view, um, that's a very unbiblical and it's a faulty system, which everyone who just takes a little bit of time to study Russia or to study German Democratic Republic which was then, you know, united with the German um, uh, Federal Republic, can see and learn this model does not really help. It leads to covered control by a few over all the others. And some will be very rich and some, most of the others will be quite poor. Um, uh, option number five, the, the current option that's being chosen in a lot of emerging and developing countries is what I call household subsistence. So what that means is um, that, you know, when I was, I've been to Uganda a number of times, and I, what I see is, you know, people selling tomatoes on the roadside all, all over the place. So you have hundreds of people who stand there with their six or eight or 12 tomatoes and sell them. So what that leads to is they're selling these tomatoes and they're, they're making as much money as they need to feed the kids in the evening, hopefully. So that's what I call household subsistence. So there's no growth perspective. There's no way of coming out of the cycle of, okay, today I have enough to buy bread for my kids. Uh, I don't know how I'm gonna pay, pay for it tomorrow. So household subsistence is basically not a solution it's just a I'm not starving solution. And that's not what the biblical perspective of growth and prosperity of a God who gives prosperity uh, is. So how do we get out of these, uh, out of these options? And what is the alternative that, that Raiffeisen is offering? Raiffeisen's way is one, he says, helping people to help themselves without condescension, but with a strong focus on community. So the model that Raiffeisen is proposing is, I'm not asking the rich to give the money to the poor. That's not what he did. I'm asking the wealthy to provide the basis for um, the availability of loan money for everybody at a good interest rates that's not gonna kill people. So it's, it's activating the, the potential of everybody themselves. So it's activating the potential of all of you. 
Um, and it's not just giving money. The core identifiers of Barclays and cooperative idea in the food and agriculture field is collective self-help. So we together form a cooperative and we help each other. It's good be because this generates self-initiative and we need self-initiative. <laughs> Excuse me. We don't need, we don't need um, a people be, being dependent on others. We don't want people dependent on banks or on external superpowers or on the government. We want, and uh, that's the biblical model of, of um, identity is you are a person that is gifted with potential. You have, uh, you have a brain, you have hands, you have feet. Uh, you can use your body to work. And with that work, you can generate something. You can build something. Um, and if you get together, um, then you can even achieve more. Because if you only work for yourself, and if you're one of these 100, 100 tomato sellers on the roadside, you can only you know, achieve as much as one tomato seller can achieve. But if you put yourself together and you organize yourself and you become 50 tomato sellers and you think about, okay, how can we, what can we do with these 5,000 tomatoes? Uh, how can we make them you know, uh, profitable for all of us and our families? Then you have a different perspective. So self-initiative. The second is self-responsibility. Um, the the Raiffeisen cooperative model creates responsibility on everybody's side. So it's not like, you know, when you have this charity model, the charity model is have no responsibility. It has in, in its in its best cases, it has some control and checks and balance systems in place, but Many times it, it, it does not create the sense of I am responsible that this goes on, this, that this will grow. I don't have the responsibility because I have this, this organization or this bank uh, who is giving me money. So it does not really foster self-responsibility. And that's what we need. We need self-responsibility that everyone in the sense of, you know, God uh, in, in, in the New Testament, there's, there are a lot of um, stories that Jesus tells where he emphasizes that you are responsible for what has been entrusted to you. You have to be steward of what has been entrusted to you. So things have been entrusted and you yourself has re have responsibility. It's not your parents. It's not your pastor. It's not your wife. It's not your husband. It's not your kids. It's not your bank. It's not your uh, organization. It's you who are responsible. So this is something that's very important. And the third factor that he um, emphasizes is self-governance. Um, he, he does not, the, the, the cooperative model just emphasizes that people are self-governing. So a cooperative is not something that is governed by the outside. A cooperative gives itself statutes. It gives itself guidelines. It gives itself a, a, a rule of order. And this is what this, the, the, the cooperative members themselves have to stick to. And everybody is everybody's controller, kind of. <laughs> because in a cooperative, everybody profits from the fact that all stick to the rules. So a cooperative will not work if only five of the 50 members of the cooperative will stick to the rules. But if all 50 stick to the rules and they control and help each other, uh, that is what we call ownership. So you have the ownership of your cooperative because you are a member. It goes far, so far that even nowadays in Germany or in, 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 in Western countries where you have the cooperative banks. Here in Germany, I have a cooperative bank here in my city. And, uh, and the difference between that bank and all the other banks is that in the cooperative bank, in the Raiffeisen bank, it's called, I can become a member. So I can buy a part of that bank. That leads to another ownership feeling of, uh, then I, I can become, uh, I can put and give them some money or I can become a, a member of, a, of an association that supports that. But if you become a member of the corporation cooperative, you buy part of that cooperative. And that if that cooperative does not work well, you will feel it in your money. 
If it goes well, you will feel it in your money. So this is ownership. And this is a very important asset and aspect of the Raiffeisen model. model. Interestingly, what Raiffeisen also emphasized, and not many people know, um, local pastors play a key role in this concept, in Raiffeisen's concept, as well as local churches as places of loving control and trust. That's what Raiffeisen emphasized. And actually no one who in the, in the non-Christian realm today researches and talks about Raiffeisen and has that facet on, on the radar because nobody really wants to look at it. But that is what I found in his original writings. He says, no one should be able to become a member of a cooperative if he does not have a clearly positive recommendation by a local pastor or the eldership of a local church. That's a very strong, uh, that's a very strong emphasis on, uh, on good reputation, on standing, on having a decent and well-known lifestyle, um, ordered your family and all of this. Uh, I find that very fascinating. Now, what concretely could you do if you would want to start something like a cooperative? Um, and what would you need to get this going? The prerequisites, prerequisites and the principles for successful uh, cooperative work are these. First thing is uh, you need to check if your nation has a legal framework for a cooperative movement. I know that most of the African countries have that. Switzerland has it definitely, Germany has it. Um, I think there's very few countries where you cannot start a cooperative. In a lot of East African countries, they're called SACOs. Um, and they're, they have, so they have different names in different countries and the structures are a little bit different. But the thing that you of course need to make sure is, is there a legal framework for cooperative movements and a co concrete starting of a cooperative in my country. Because, you know, what, I, what I'm suggesting here today is not that this is just a theoretical lecture on cooperatives. What I'm suggesting is that you should think about starting a cooperative yourself. Find a, a two handful of people, find something that you would like to do together where you can work together and then start a cooperative because it gives you a lot of power and it gives you business development options. The second thing that you will need and that Raiffeisen have, has emphasized as he got older and got asked, okay, Raiffeisen, what, are you, what have you learned from your life doing cooperative work? And then he said, it is very important that you have well-crafted statutes. So you need first to draft good statutes as the basis. And there's lots of them um, that you can look at out there on the internet. You'll find, uh, if you go and search for cooperative statute, um, there's some from Raiffeisen himself and from cooperatives he was involved with, but there's also a lot of more modern ones. And of course, you won't have to think about, is this more a, a banking cooperative? Is this more a food uh, and, and crop uh, cooperative? Is this more a... Uh, craftsmen, uh, craftswomen cooperative. What kind of cooperative will it be? It will need a little bit different statutes, but <clears throat> you need to have solid statutes as the basis of everything. And of course, um, the statutes then need to be lived according to. So you need to have, um, when somebody becomes a member of a cooperative and the statutes are placed in front of him or her, you need to have 100% buy-in into these statutes. And if someone does not comply with what the statutes say, you need to have clearly implemented structures how to kick that person out. Because it is, there's nothing that's more destructive for a cooperative than persons who are members of cooperatives who are not acting according to the statutes. The statutes are kind of the guarantee for trust for all the external partners other banks, other business partners, et cetera. So the third thing that I find interesting is that Raiffeisen found out that you, you should have a broad membership from poor farmers to wealthy citizens. Um, that, that's the case because 
he said, what that what happens then if you have that is that your credibility as cooperative grows massive. So if you only are, if you are only, you know, kind of a, a small group of fairly poor farmers, you can start a cooperative, of course, but it will help you if you find a few wealthy citizens or other farmers who have a little more <clears throat> um, and they don't need to give you money. So they don't need to give money to you in the sense of giving or donating or something like that. They just need to say, we are members of this cooperative because we believe in the fact that this will work. And we also buy a part of it. So every member of a cooperative is owns a part of it. And that's important because when the cooperative goes bad, uh, all of you go bad. So everybody goes bad, everybody loses. Uh, and that's what, what I was talking about when I talked about ownership. So. Um, permanent stable organization for common activity that is necessary to build trust. So if the, the organization or the cooperative is going off and on all the time and then it's there's some people there and then there's nobody there, if there is not a stable organization for the external viewer, that's not going to build trust. So you need to find a solid group of people that will stick to this for a, for a number of years in order to really build trust to external partners. That's very important. Otherwise you will not be able to, to walk into a bank and say, you know, we are cooperative X, Y, Z, and we need this much money in order to do this. And we have, if you look at our, um, our record, you can see that we have been very busy and very active and very reliable over the last five years. The bank then will say, okay, we will give you a little bit money to try and then you will maybe get a second charge, and maybe then a third. Uh, but but that's how it that's how it works. Interestingly, Raiffeisen emphasizes that it is important to involve pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers also not uh, the, the school teachers, because pastors and teachers back in his day were the ones who who knew everybody, so they knew every person in the in the community. Okay, someone has I didn't ask you to make it. I just said, help me put onions. Yes. Please, you can leave there. I can cook the rest. I don't want to be distracted again. I'm sorry. You can go if you want to. I have not understood the, the point. Please make it again. Please don't cook for me. I didn't ask you to. No, it's, it's just about, I just made it more and then I leave it. Honey, mute your mic. Honey, mute oh, your thanks. microphone. <laughs> Thank you. I thought they were talking to me. I'm sorry, please. It's all good. No problem. So, um, the, you need good and solid leadership. Um, think about biblical qualifications for elders to be applied. Um, that's what Rafa has also emphasized. He said, if you don't, if you have leadership that's not reliable and not not solid, you will not find anybody to really, you know, join the cooperative. You will not find business partners who will do business with you. You will not find banks who will be willing to put money into you. That's not going to happen. So, see and look exactly who are you going to put in leadership positions in the cooperative. You don't have many leadership positions, but there are a few. Um, what Raiffeisen emphasized is interesting also that the, the board, uh, so the, the board are the control members, supervisory board members, um, should not receive any payments. Why is that? Um, and how would you find people? So this is the place where he put the wealthy. He put the wealthy there um, with a double, kind of with a double perspective. First thing is he said, um, the wealthy know how to deal with money, so they're not afraid of dealing with money. They're not afraid of talking about money. They're not afraid about uh, talking about problems. Uh, most of them, at least at his time, was the case. But at the same time, if you don't give them any money, they're not. You can't bribe them. You you cannot. You know, say okay, I'll give you this much money. So 
you can uh, guarantee me the loan for this and that, that uh, situation. So what he was emphasizing is that the board members should be volunteers and not receive payments in order to not make it manipulable. You, you cannot manipulate board members that are just there because they want to be there and they like the idea of having a cooperative and, and helpful, being helpful in the cooperative. Um, that makes it hard to manipulate the boards. Um, important is also, he said, if you want to have a successful cooperative, you need to have honesty, diligence, frugality, and hard work as lifestyle principles of the members of the cooperative. So if you have lazy uh, people, people who lie, um, who, who don't really work uh, well, um, who don't deliver good quality, that will negatively influence the, uh, the, in the output of the cooperative. But if you want, because you know the, the, the people that buy your products will see that you deliver low quality, that will lead to a bad reputation of the whole cooperative. So what you need is the cooperative needs to, to work uh, very diligently. Everybody in the cooperative needs to be very honest. You need to be frugal, have to frugality. You need to know, have a saving mentality and, and also the willingness to work hard. And I would define these right from the beginning so people who don't like these will not even want to join the cooperative because they know that if I become member of this cooperative, it will, it will mean I will have to be honest, I will have to be diligent, I'll have to work, and I'll have to be a saving person. Uh, so if you know this will keep people away from you that you don't want. Um, then what what Breivisen himself also experienced is it's very important that you bring the members of the cooperative together regularly. Uh, and you have meetings with instruction, lectures, living a godly life for all members, but also information, of course, that's necessary for the, for the cooperative as a whole, need to be passed on and, and reflected and talked about and questions need to be asked and people need to be able to answer and all of that. So the, the idea is that it's not just a, a, a board that meets when there is the request for a loan, or and then there is this, uh, uh, maybe a CEO, one one single person that's being paid, and then a lot of members who never meet. He says it's important that the members meet in order to have uh, close connections and to have um, personal relationships, which builds trust, which creates also some responsibility feeling for everybody. So that's why I think cooperatives should not be implemented or will probably not really work when there are long distance uh, cooperatives. So a cooperative of two people in Africa, two in India and two in the United States is not the idea of a cooperative. The cooperative always has this local focus because it connects people together, it creates responsibility and it creates uh, a spirit of, of good and hard work. No dividends or profit shares paid to members above the usual average interest rate. So um, the, the, the secret of the growth of a cooperative is this. Because what happens when the cooperative runs well, when it generates income and it creates profits, and everybody just gets paid out everything that the profit is, the, the cooperative will not grow. Um, but if the cooperative only gives this to the people that the usual interest rate from the banks, when you give money to the banks, not loan money from the banks, uh, these average interest rates should be given to all members for what they have put in, but not more. Um, because this is, will be the secret to the growth of the cooperative. And it's, it, this is the principle of frugality. You don't you know, go out and spend everything you earn, you save some in order to become bigger, to be, become stronger, to become uh, more future oriented. The power split is very important. Um, and Breibazen experimented a little bit with, with the power split and he said at the end of the day, his experience was, and I, I can confirm that from my perspective, 
you should at least have a triple or quadruple power split. So you have different um, checks and balances in, this is kind of a built-in control mechanism. So no, a no of these, none of these power levels can do things all on its own. You always have some other instance controlling it. So the General Assembly will always be able, which includes all members of the cooperative, for example, will always be able to ask um, responsibility from the executive board. Uh, and the supervisory board also will ask, um, um, require responsibility giving and accounting from the executive board. The financial clerk, the only paid position, the, ma the, the man managing the money, will be controlled by supervisory board and general assembly and executive board. So you have these controls forth and back so that you need to make sure that there is no corruption, that there is no money flowing out anywhere and that nobody is doing things for his own private purposes. Uh, even you know, giving away loans, which sometimes usually the executive board plus the financial clerk decides uh, should not be based on the fact that you know this man and he's your personal friend or something like that. That's why we always have group. Uh, we only have boards. Boards is, a board is always more than one person. It's more than one. So it, there needs to be three, four, five. Uh, so the, 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 the multiple perspectives guarantee um, and the power split guarantee that you have control mechanisms against corruption. Uh, which is a, a problem, as you all know. Um, and then, of course, Murat hasn't said, you should only give loans to people that are living a godly life and have, have a positive reputation. So <clears throat> loan, giving loans to people means that they are, they, they are becoming members of the cooperative, in, in this case. You cannot walk up to, to the cooperative and ask for a loan without becoming a member. But you should only take on those people as members and give loans to them that are living a godly life and have a good reputation in, in, the, in the city, in the, in the town, wherever you are. So, you know, if, if you look at all these, um, then in, it, all in all, it's a, it's a large number of very powerful principles um, that are installed in a, in a well-functioning um, cooperative. The last point is that um, they have found out that one of the principles that should be put down in the statutes is you should know you do not do any risky investments. Um, you should only invest in people and in, in, in um, assets that are solid, that are um, sh relatively safe and not do risky investment stuff uh, because the money own is on this is all our money the cooperative owns the money and it's my money and your money and your money so we can decide um, that this should not be put into risky investments so now um, reflecting and perspectives on today Emerging and developing countries' focus on receiving help has created something that I call a learned helplessness, um, an acquired helplessness. Um, I've talked about this before on another slide, but it, it, it's, it's, it's important to emphasize that the cooperative model empowers um, EDCs, emerging and developing countries, because it does not keep them in a, in a blind dependency on, on money received from the outside. It gives the EDCs the possibility to use what they have, even if it's little, and to start something from the ground up <coughs> without massive investments from the outside. That's a great asset and a great, um, a great uh, perspective for, for people in the EDCs. Um, we have seen an example in India where the government has tried, uh, because they found the idea of, of, of cooperatives, found them good. And they said, okay, let's do government uh, cooperatives. So we will organize the cooperatives. We will be the cooperatives. Uh, what that led to is 
only problems. It did not work. Why did it not work? Because the, the aspect of ownership of the cooperative members was not there. So what that led to was corruption, uh, dishonesty, no forgot, no hard work mentality. People uh, saw cooperatives as a different kind of bank where they just loaned money and then they could spend it and they could never pay it back. Um, the other factor that uh, for today is <clears throat> shepherds are needed to oversee such a movement locally. Um, the Indian article with the title Fine Drive Eisen brings it down to reality. They What they said there was that this person, Reif Eisen, has a key role in, in the whole development here because you need one person who sees the necessity and who emphasizes these aspects that I've been talking about before as, as a model, as a principle, um, as a, a toolbox. And if you don't have someone who does that, um, you will not you will not, not see the cooperative movement fly. Because the, basically Raiffeisen was something like a shepherd. So he what he did was not profit himself. He did not get rich through starting the cooperative movement. Um, but he helped other people to become themselves powerful and successful. So what we need are initiators, uh, winning exemplary living persons like him. So if, if, if you now today are listening uh, and thinking about, okay, maybe is this something that's interesting for us, for, for my town, for my family, for my you know surrounding where I live, then yes, maybe it is. But what it takes is a, a person like Raiffeisen who, who says, who himself, herself takes on the role of, okay, I am the one living this idea and I'm carrying it as, as part of my heart. That's what I call a shepherd. So the, the question of course, is how to deal with the needed startup money today, as opposed to Raiffeisen's time when he invited local wealthy persons um, that's an open question. Maybe you have ideas uh, for that, but I think it could even work without these wealthy persons putting money in um, because the potential for this idea to multiply is even there when you have 20 people, for example, putting their money into a, a pocket, into a bucket, and then starting from there and developing the cooperative idea. So then just pointing out a few connections, um, I'll go quickly over this. Uh, you will get the presentation uh, as a PDF afterwards. So you can then look at it in detail and go search these on the internet. You know, there, there are a lot of organizations working and supporting the cooperative idea. And some of them are these that I have named here. Um, then there is Dan Jansen, who is an American living in, at least he was living in South Sudan until last year, I think. There's uh, CSS Farming uh, Nigeria Training Center. Um, the Canaan Farmers School centers are in different parts of the world. Um, so there, there are local specialists uh, who can also help you in the implementation. And, and uh, I think some of the YOM uh, personnel and staff can also help you, or you can reach out to me or to others in my network that I can help you find who will, who will um, support you in the, in, you know, in, in trying to implement a cooperative. And I would be very interested to hear if anything um, concrete from this uh, call is being developed. So if you would inform me, that would be wonderful because then I, can in some future lectures say uh, <clears throat> there are examples in Africa or in other parts where this idea has, has taken uh, on concrete form. Um, in recent times, and I'll talk a little about, about this later, um, Canaan Farmers School, New Village Movement Korea um, is one of the, the newer realizations of the cooperative idea. Um, 
Akili Group, Kenya, Bahar and Bachira. I don't know, maybe some of you know this. Um, and many others listed in these on these internet links. Um, I have not checked them today, but you will find them when you type in, even if the link is not working, it should be working. Um, yeah, so to, to wrap up for the first uh, part of this lecture, um, practical implication, what does this all mean for us? Um, this presentation is not offering easy solutions. So I'm not telling you how to find money or how to you know, build a business overnight. Um, I'm also not giving you hints at how to, you know, find uh, donors. Um, in fact, it will take courageous individuals who live an exemplary and sacrificial life to, to get this idea moving. But um, the potential that, uh, in my eyes, is in, in the um, cooperative movement is so big that I think it should be recovered and I think, especially for the emerging and developing countries, the, the cooperative idea has a lot of power. So what it will take maybe is, it needs, needs a work group of, of a few people who sit together, pray, read. So you need to read things and then think, and then draft a plan, draft statutes, which they show to others and convince them of it and start a cooperative. Um, so this is my um, inclination to, <laughs> to bring you to a place where you say, okay, what does this have to do with me? Is it maybe possible for me to start a cooperative, to think about a cooperative, to find others? Um, and maybe you will have to do this, sit together, pray, read, and think, draft a plan, and draft statutes. That, that was, would be my um, suggestion for you. And um, I think at this point, I will make a break. Um, maybe I'll take a few questions now. Is that OK? Yeah. All right. Since we have after, minutes, after the break, we'll talk about Korea. The ones who are on the, over Zoom, uh, it would be good if you put your questions on a chat because of some network issues. Yes, very good. Thank you. You can also add comments or thoughts from your side that where you maybe have a different opinion or uh, have thoughts on, on this lecture, that's also fine. You know, my question would be, um, so you say that um, the loans are only for the members, so no no loans, um, no loans to people who are not member of the corporation. Yeah, that that would be my initial suggestion. Um, maybe in a later in a later phase of of a cooperative, which is in fact in Germany the case. A lot of, you know, Raiffeisen Bank, I can go to a Raiffeisen Bank without being a member and, and borrow money from them. I can make a loan. Um, but for the beginning, I, my suggestion would be to not give any money to anybody outside of the cooperative. Um, because in the beginning, you need to build stability, credibility, trust for the, in the members inside and for the outside partners. That's why I suggest to, for the start phase, not give any money to anybody else. Thank you. I have a question. Um, do you have any experience in post-Sovietic uh, areas where they uh, created a cooperative? Because we are living in Moldova and we think about to do something, but the mentality, it, it is really post-Sovietic and it's very hard to find people like you described in, um, in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I have no experience uh, in the in the Eastern Bloc of Europe, um, post-Soviet Bloc. I have no experience there. But I think the you know 
what I've given you is kind of like a blueprint. Um, and you can start even with only three people. That's not a problem. If you are three that are um, willing to comply to the rules and the statutes that you yourself write and, and identify, that's fine. You don't need more than three or four. And then if it, as it grows, you can, you can get bigger, but you should have a kind of a, an introductory course for everybody who wants to become a member, explaining very clearly what is expected of a member of the cooperative. And I, th that's why I think it, it has so much potential because you can yourself steer that process. You don't have, you know, some external person who does it, but the people building, uh, being the cooperative can themselves control what happens and they can agree to accept someone or they can decline. They can say, no, we don't want this person to become a member because it's not clear enough that the person is really willing to invest to be frugal, live frugality and hard work and, and the spirit of, you know, uh, commitment and all of that. There is a question in the chat box. Um, if you agree, I would quickly go over that. Somebody writes, I, uh, I'm already thinking of starting one in one of our rural mission centers here in Nigeria. What resources can you offer us apart from money to help us run seamlessly? Well, money I don't have, <laughs> but what I what I what I can can offer you is I can offer you a lot of material like uh, exemplary statutes. Um, and I think in the beginning, having statutes is one of the most important. So the statutes themselves will, of course, not make anything work because it's just a piece of paper. But if you have something that that will define your identity. And you can communicate that to someone else and say, look, this is what we want and who we are and how things work in our in our community, in our cooperative in this case. Then you have you have the starting point when you have a few people that are committed to it and a, a clear statute paper um, where you define the purpose and the rules, then you have a good basis to get started. And I can, I can, of course, give you some exemplary statutes from uh, cooperatives. There's another question that came in uh, in the chat. In working as cooperative organization, everyone in the cooperative has his or her strength. How do you blend them together in other achieve your goal? How to blend them together in others to achieve your goal? I assume that means. Um, of course, um, that's why you have different roles. The statutes define different roles. So you have members. You have people in an executive, you have people in a, in a supervisory, you have someone who is a financial clerk. Uh, you may have, even have more roles. Uh, some, in in Raifatten's time, he had somebody who was, you know, kind of the uh, overseer of the, um, you know, when, when, they, when they had bought wheat, they needed a person to oversee that barn. Um, you know, that was one person who was being paid and the, the clerk was being paid. So um, what is, of course, it's the case that you need to find your gifts and your strengths um, as you organize yourself in a cooperative uh, and then try to, um, try to identify, maybe you are lacking somebody, maybe you are lacking someone who can do a financial clerk position. The clerk, uh, the, the financial overseer, the financial officer is someone who needs to be acquainted with numbers, of course, he needs to have some experience in handling numbers and handling money. He needs to be reliable. He or she needs to be reliable, of course, um, and needs to be the, have the trust and the um, support of everybody in the board and in the in the general assembly. So the, these things, of course, need to be organized. And sometimes you will have to go and say, "Okay, I need to find someone else who um, who can help us." Um, because we are lacking someone in the team with this 
competency or with this profile. Yeah, I hope that. <laughs> okay, I hope this is the right one. Let's see. Uh, it's quite good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now uh, for the next for the next round, I would like to share a little bit with you about the Canaan Pharma School Korea, which may sound very uninteresting for you because you think what what does a German want to talk about Korean? Say doesn't know anything about Korea. So um, yes, true and not true. I've I've also been to Korea a number of times and I have a lot of Korean friends. And I've uh, profited very much from, from that connection and I would like to share with you and my challenge for you now is you need to find out what is the connection between what I was talking about when I was talking about Raiffeisen and what does this have to do with uh, CFS Korea, Canon Pharma School Korea? What is the connection? You need to be alert um, and thinking about where is that connection? Um, so 1945, Korea came out of a 35-year occupation period from by the Japanese. Um, Korea was a country um, that was very, very poor. It took loans from Uganda and other African countries, which, which gives you an impression of how poor it was. Nobody wanted to give money to, to Koreans because they thought Korea will never be uh, a prosperous nation again. So they're kind of destroyed. So we better not give them money. So they took money from African countries that did not really have much themselves. But they were lending money uh, to Korea. Uh, it was one of, one of the five poorest countries in the world, actually. So poorer than a lot of African countries was Korea. Um, Koreans died from hunger um, in winters. Um, Korea has a quite um, a large portion of Korea is mountainous. So there's high mountains. Um, and it's very it's very hard to uh, to grow a uh, crop and, and do agriculture in Korea in at least in parts of it. 2023, that means a number of years later, Korea's GDP globally is number ten. Uh, it has a higher uh, GDP than Russia, Switzerland, um, I'm gonna look here, Australia, Spain, Netherlands, and many others. So how did that happen? How did that happen in such a fast time? So it's uh, 55 years plus 23 years, a little bit more than uh, 60, 70 years around. And in that short period of time, how could Korea change its position from one of the poorest countries to one of the, the best earning countries in the world? You know, many of the, uh, the Hyundai Motor Company the Kia Motor Company, one of the largest um, uh, docks where they build ships is in Korea globally. Um, so Korea has has is in many sectors. The the company that most of you all know, Samsung, uh, comes from Korea actually. So a lot of companies that you all know and use almost daily uh, are Korean uh, are Korean companies uh, or come from Korean companies. How did that happen? How was that possible? So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this man, Kim Yong-ki. Uh, he is being spelled differently. Uh, so, you, um, but, so I'm not a Korean, and I know a little bit of Korean only. He was the founder of the Canaan Pharma School movement, and he believed that things could change for the better with a lifestyle of work, service, and sacrifice. That was his um, motto, one of his mottos. He practiced and lived a can-do mindset. What do I mean by that? Pro mindset is probably one of the most important components of change. That is what Kim Yong ki had understood. So, I mean, in Germany, we have sayings like, uh, you can always focus on the fact that the glass is half empty, or you can focus on the fact that the glass is half filled. It depends on your perspective. Um, the, the, the water in the glass is always the same. The question is, do you focus on half empty or half full glass? And you would say probably Kim Yong-ki is the one who would always focus on the fact that it's half full. 
you have a lot to do, you have a lot to start out with. Um, and I'll explain to you the essence of his philosophy or his perspective on what is kind of Canaan Farmer School um, in at, at its heart. So first principle that, that he implemented and lived even personally, very personally, is change myself first. The first key teaching he, he taught is things change always from the inside to the outside. It's never the other way around. So you cannot change the system by changing its, um, uh, its outer appearance or organizing things differently. It has to be changed from the inside out, which means the heart of the things, the heart of the people, the ideas that, that, that drive us are the part where it starts when you want to change something, start from the inside, and then that will work itself to the outside. Um, a change, he says, starts with you. It starts not with change my boss, change my money, change my spouse, change my government, my neighbor. It must begin with change myself first. So the, the task is on me, on you. It, it cannot be delegated to anybody else. This is one of the, the key components that he um, pointed out and a term that was already used in my presentation on Raiffeisen right shows up here again, ownership. Um, you must take ownership of your need to change first. So pioneering mindset is the second thing that he pointed out. What, that's a key component of, of Canaan Farmer School ideas. The first key to change myself, uh, which is what he says in the first point, is mindset. So not money. Um, we must change how we think in order to change how we act. It is, it is all a question of mindset. It is all a question of perspective. It is all a question of attitude and position. This is what, what he said, by changing ourselves first, it makes us a pioneer, a leader. So if you wait for other people to come and tell you what is good and what is important, what you should do and, and how you should do it, that is always a passive role. You have a passive role in that model. What Kim Young ki emphasized was, you have to become a pioneer and an initiator, somebody who initiates change, him or herself. So don't wait for someone to come to you and tell you what you what you are to do, uh, but start yourself uh, with a change. And then the third thing he said, the third principle is work, serve, sacrifice. And it's, <laughs> the interesting thing is, um, I work first, I serve first. I sacrifice first. That's one of the slogans that Canaan Farmer School has been coining over these decades. And um, interesting thing is that uh, he doesn't say, I work, I serve, I sacrifice, but he says, I work first. So I don't wait for other people to start working and, and then I'll start too. So I'm not sitting there and waiting for someone else to start working and then I'm joining that person. But I start myself to do it first. I serve first. I don't wait for other people to serve me until and then I start serving them. I don't sacrifice when I see other people sacrificing, but I start with sacrificing myself. Independently of the question if anyone else sacrifices. And you know, when you think that through, you come... Uh, you come to a point where you think of people like Martin Luther King. So there's a person that identifies something that is needed to be pointed out. And independently of the fact whether any single one person follows me or not, I position myself. I start talking. I start doing. I start serving, sacrificing myself. I don't wait for anyone else to, to do the first step. I start by doing what I can do. So fourth element is, and that's interesting, uh, and actually the, um, 
I believe there is something coming back of this to the Western countries and the Western nations. In the uh, Canaan Farmer School model, farmers are very, very highly esteemed and as um, and valued. Farming, um, the Canaan Farmer School system says, is the foundation of a healthy nation. So when a nation does not do good farming anymore, it is going to stop. It's just a question of time. And it also is not using the entrusted good that God has given to it in a way that is God pleasing and God honoring. Because the, the land, the ground, the, 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 the good soil that God has given you is one of the biggest assets God has given a nation. So when the nation is giving soil, God is asking you to be a faithful steward with that soil. And to be honest, when I, when I was for the first time in Central and Eastern Africa, and I've seen the, and I've seen the richness of what you could grow. The same thing is, is uh, Vishal Mangalwadi is saying about India. When you think about what you could grow, I think the, the, the nutrition specialists of the global uh, health programs and food programs say that just Congo alone could, if well done, well farmed, could feed all of Africa. All of Africa could be fed if only this one nation would be good stewards with the soil, the ground, and the natural resources that God has given that nation. I'm not talking about selling gold or diamonds or something to others and then buying wheat for that. I'm only talking about farming. So the potential that lies in, in farming and in, in growing things from the soil, from the ground, is extremely high and it is extremely important for the growth of the wealth and the health of a nation. Food sovereignty is ultimately the most important security, is what uh, Canaan Pharma School has have emphasized. And of course, you have seen that just lately when nations are dependent on other nations what concerning food sovereignty, and I'm not talking about nations that have a problem with, with uh, you know, Sahara nations have a different situation, but even there, even, even in the Sahara situation or in the Sahel zone, um, you, there, there are possibilities what you can do if you just focus on technology and, and um, development of technologies that will serve to make these soils um, to grow food. And they can. Um, Israel has shown it, for, for example. So the fourth principle he, he emphasized, they emphasized, <clears throat> Kate and Palmer School emphasized, is the fact of frugality. <clears throat> and you've heard that today already uh, in the other lecture, the other first part. And this is also something that they emphasize very much. Um, Kim Young ki has, has clearly said that nothing should be wasted, neither time, nor money, nor food, not even soap or electricity or water. So we should be very... Um, conscious about the use of the resources that God has entrusted us. And that is a basic principle that comes from the Bible and can be applied to a lot of different areas of life um, and taken in combination with the others, it becomes very powerful. And then of course, interestingly, he, um, Kenny Farmer School emphasizes patriotism, not in a negative sense, not in a, um, nationalist supremacy sense, but in the sense of the ultimate purpose of changing myself is not that I become rich or that I find food. It is to, to flow into the service to your family, your community, and your nation. Nation is an expansion of your family. That's what Canaan Farmer School says. So you take care of your family, you take care of your community, you invest yourself into farming frugality, hard work, diligence, etc. And then you do serve, at the end, you serve your nation.
So th these are six guiding elements of what Ken Farmer School said. I'll let you see the other first three. Change yourself first, pioneering mindset, work, self sacrifice, farming, frugality, and patriotism. That's what, what I'm not talking, this is not my personal position. This is what Kim Yong ki has said and written. So this is an interesting graph, I think. If you look at the, the, um, the red line, um, you can see the worldwide growth in aid. So money being given to emerging and developing countries. 1970s, it was here, and then it went up, 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 and it broke down a little bit in the middle of the 90s. Um, but what you see is the growth GDP per capita in those countries that received this help, this aid, uh, is it's going up here, up and down a little bit. And then as aid grows and doubles and triples and quadruples, growth falls down. GDP falls. So this is interesting because you would expect it to go up, but it doesn't. So what aid, and this is something that the, the Canaan Farmer School approach uh, says, aid is not the solution for nations that are ailing and that need healing. Nations that need healing need basically self-help initiatives based on the principles that Canaan Farmer School and Raiffeisen have also positioned. So the conventional humanitarian aid is based on socioeconomic theories theories, the Canaan Farmers School way is based on a true story on the Bible. Uh, conventional humanitarian aid is program-based. It is resources-based. Canaan way is a lifestyle. It's very simple. Program-based complex. The mindset is the key here, and here the resources are the key. So you always put in more resources to change things here the thought is you need to change the mindset of the people, individuals, and that will change the situation. Here, it is unnatural. It's often top down. It starts big and then it falls down. This is very natural. It's inside out and it starts small, the Canaan way, changing things. The uh, normal humanitarian aid system is not income generating. It's actually decouraging, not encouraging to start businesses. The Canaan way is a family business model. It says you start something with, with what you have. This is taught by experts and this is taught through life. This here, the, the con conventional humanitarian aid is replicable to those lucky enough to get aid. This can be multiplied into any nation, into any situation, into even in, even in communist war settings. It, it, it will even work there. It will work anywhere. The conventional human aid system is not inspiring to those without access to aid. The Canaan way is very inspiring because it's something from nothing. It starts with nothing. You don't have to have anything to start with it. Um, this year seems to be fast, but may not last. This seems to be slow, but it has long-term effect. The conventional humanitarian aid is considered to be professional, so to say. The Canaan way is a way that you will be laughed at. But look at the consequences. If you look at the consequences here, this model actually does not lead to growth in nations. The other model, the Canaan way, actually does lead to growth and to stability and to an entrepreneurial spirit that can empower a whole nation. So <clears throat> what is the mindset um, that is helpful for development? It is a can-do mindset. It's a positive mindset. As I said, the glass is half full. It's not half empty. We're not always talking about the deficits the deficit and the problems and everything that we can't do, uh, but it's talking about what is the possibilities, where we can, where we can invest, where we can grow, where we can get better, and how can we achieve the next step. 
It focuses on responsibilities. That's also something that you saw in, in Raiffeisen's model and the cooperative model. It also focuses on responsibilities. Work is a blessing in this developmental, in, in the CFS mindset. And in, in the other mindset, work is a curse. So you're trying, you know, in, in Germany, they're asking for the four, the four day week. Um, the, um, the unions are asking for a four day week, which is completely stupid and crazy. Because what happens is people will not, will not know what to do with their time, so they're gonna do rubbish. They're gonna waste their money, they're gonna ruin their families, they're not gonna take care of, of families, it's just the opposite. Because work is viewed as a curse. Um, we try to reduce the time and work more and more, which is not really healthy for families. Work is a blessing, that's a biblical perspective. It is something that God has blessed us with. This is future oriented, this is past oriented. The mindset from CFS, Canaan Farmers is future oriented. It's, it's, it values time. Um, so it, it does not offer quick fix solutions, but it, it, it adheres to biblical principles of sowing and growing and reaping. This is biblical, very biblical principles. It seeks justice. This allows corruption. It sees many resources. It, so it sees all the resources that we have. It values people. It values relationships. And that's all uh, in, the, in, the, in the not helpful mindsets, um, in, the, um, in the dependency mindsets or in the fatalistic mindsets. And these are the, the typical positions in, in these other mindsets. So why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you all of this because we need to realize that it is not organizational um, structures. It is not finances. It is in not even technology that will bring us to a higher level of business efficiency. It is at the end of the day, the question that we all have to deal with is what is our mindset? What is our perspective on life? What is our perspective on our own uh, role in life? Are we just receivers? Are we just uh, cursed people who need to work because we, it's, a dire, uh, it's a dire thing that God wants us to work and actually we want to have leisure time and we want to go do fun things. Is that what we're all about? No. Ken Farmer School says, no, that's not the case. And that's not going to lead your nation to a growth and successful and a blessed position. And I'll give you a few examples of very practical slogans and chants that, that uh, in, in the Canaan Farmer School, everybody learns and they chant these while they work. Say, so they say, let's learn until we know. Let's devote ourselves to work. Let's serve in humility. And you know, the, the powerful factor of, of slogans or chants is that once you memorize them, you internalize them, they become part of your habits and part of your mindset. So I think what we can learn from Canaan Farmer School movement is that they have positions and mindset um, techniques to develop the mindset that are, that are helpful. They may not be uh, popular, <laughs> but I think they are very, they're in themselves, they're powerful and helpful. This one is, I think, one of the most powerful I've seen. Start with what you have. So if you have one handful of rice, that's fine. Start with that one handful of rice. Don't wait until you have 50 bags of rice. If you have one plot of land that's only a square inch or you know 50 square meters or very small, you, that's what you have. Don't wait to have the double, but start with what you have. That's what they did. So they had farmers starting with very, very small plots of land in Korea. And what, what this mindset position and this biblical and Christian position and, and attitude 
led to is that people were starting to be good stewards of the small that they had received. And that changed Korea. It changed the whole nation. Change myself first, change now first, change here first, change small things first, change doable things first, change until the end. So you see one, one word sticks until the end, that's the word change. So if we don't do anything, we procrastinate. That's we become lazy. We say, okay, I will do this tomorrow. I'll pick it up tomorrow. Why do you have to wait until tomorrow? Why don't you do it now? Why don't you start today? Why are you waiting until tomorrow? Why don't we always just, you know, pick up the things that are in front of us and start doing them? This is a powerful too, I think. This is a very powerful one. And this is actually one they, they really repeat. Uh, I've seen that in the school there. Do not eat to eat, but eat to work. <laughs> if you don't like to work, do not eat. Work at least four hours for each meal. I mean, this is nothing to stick to as a legalistic. Or, you, you know, all of this is only... It's structural suggestions. <laughs> it's not. It's not like laws. It's not like you know. Uh, you, you. It can be four. It can be three. It can be five hours. Whatever. This is not important. The important thing is that there is a spirit of um, connect work with eating. Eat because you work. Eat to work. If you don't like to work, don't eat. Work on your attitude towards work. And so this creates an attitude and a, an evaluation and an esteem for eating. That's different from, you know, we sit down and we eat because we have now, it's time to eat. So this is creation of, of attitudes and postures. Um, I'll give you a few sources of information on on the, the, if you want to look more in detail at this Korean model, there's a book um, that talks about reinventing Africa's development, linking Africa to the Korean development model. And that is available online for free. You can download it as a PDF and read it. Uh, and it has a lot of very, very good content that can be extremely helpful. I suggest you start reading it. There's a little booklet, it's called a new nations, hope for every nation from Canaan Pharma School and Korea's uh, National Transformation. I have it as a PDF. You can get it from me. Um, there's a Facebook site, Canaan Global Leadership Center. So th there's a few places where you can go and find more information on this this Canaan Pharma School. Um, and this is a little bit background on Korea's economy. And you will get this presentation, as, as I said, as a PDF, so you can click yourself through these links and get the get things yourself. So, okay. Now, what is, what is the implications of all of this that I was talking about? I think there's two levels of implications. And I'm only, almost finished with uh, the main input, and we can discuss a little more on what you think. The, the first level of implications is the concepts in themselves. So the Raiffeisen concept, the Kane and Pharma School concept, uh, which can be looked at, can be studied, can be implemented, adapted, etc. So the, the, I've been presenting you two different models of how self-help and self-initiative um, um, business development models can be implemented in, in different situations. And we can learn from them, we can adapt them, we can use them. Then, but then there is a second level of implications. The development of these and similar concepts shows living based on a biblical work ethic and thinking based on a biblical Christian worldview leads to innovative and people blessing ideas and activities. So let me explain this a little bit more in detail. What, what do I mean by that? This gentleman, Raiffeisen, was a person 
that developed an idea that was not there before. Why did he do that? How did he come up with it? He came up with these thoughts because he was rooted in a biblical work ethic and in a biblical Christian worldview. And he looked at life, looked at society, looked at the challenges of society through these glasses of a biblical work ethic, a biblical worldview. And then he analyzed what he saw and he developed an innovative idea, which was cooperative idea. And then he refined it and worked on it. And the same thing, why did this Kim Yong-ki become the changer of Korea's history? Why did this happen? Because he was rooted in biblical work ethic, biblical worldview thinking, looked at the situation his nation was in, and found that there are solutions in biblical thinking for the problems that he saw in his nations. So what does that mean for us? I think if we, and this is what you're actually doing, because this is the, the, the school for biblical and Christian worldview. So if you think correctly about what is a biblical worldview, what does it include, what does it implement, what, how can it be lived? If you teach and learn about biblical worldview, this will in turn lead, if you look at society through the glasses of this biblical worldview, this will bring you to a point where you can um, potentially develop solutions for problems that your society has based on these thinkings, on the biblical worldview, on the biblical work, work, work ethic, etc. So this is why it is so important that we, we learn about the biblical and Christian worldview. And this is why you have been studying people like Landa Cope or uh, Bishop Mangalwadi and um, listening to Marcus Reichenbach and all these important people um, because they teach you to think in a, in a, in a biblical worldview perspective and that will then lead in turn, when you use that based on this, uh, I, I find the Korean uh, Kane Pharma School model, the, the, basically the most important point that they really bring to the table is that they say, don't wait for others to stop, but pick it up yourself, get going, don't wait for anybody else, but initiate what needs to be done. So this is the most important input. I find that so powerful because it brings us out of the passive expectancy to wait for this big solution that someone is going to bring from the government or from you know, some organization or from some mission board or from some church or from wherever, uh, which is, it's never going to come. It's not going to happen. Because God is asking you to do the first step and to become the changer of yourself and then everything around you. So, and, and that is, I think, that is such a powerful concept that has led to the change of lots of nations. This is what drove Martin Luther in Germany. This is what drove Calvin in Switzerland. This is what drove uh, William Carey in India. This is what drove Kim Jong-ki in Korea. This is what drove Raiffeisen back in the 1900s. You know, it's all these people have said, I will not wait for someone else to stop doing things because I myself can stop and I will. So this is my call to you. Is it maybe time for you to get started with the little you have, even if it's only very little, but start doing something about, based on your biblical thinking and the biblical worldview, how can you change, how can you transform your community, your family for the better by using these tools that I've presented today to you or maybe others that need to be developed for your context that I don't even know about. So this is my, these are my five cents of input that I would like to share with you. And now we can uh, continue 
discussing, asking questions, and um, I have my lecture material is is free. Any questions or comments, write in the chat, please. Um, I'll open the chat now. Can I can Look. I this Jess? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I I just want to appreciate you sincerely for this topic you've been handling. I I want to really say that um, this topic has been a blessing. I did my SBCW in 2020, and um, looking at some of the topics that we had taught, this and the project we did, um, initiated a lot of things. Uh, presently, we, we went into fish farming, and uh, through that process, this year, we, we expounded into farming. We have uh, some numbers of uh, land that we are cultivating yam and cassava. Why am I saying this? Is I'm a Y1 leader, and I see most of the challenges we face uh, among our staffs and those that really want to do service for God one, the financial constraint. And I believe that if each and every one of us will take to this, it will not only help us, it will help our base. Our next focus now um, is getting a property, a land for the project. And we are thinking of expanding into Pigri and all that. But that's not our final point. Because what I'm looking at is uh, creating a microfinance you know, that will be able to actually reach the grassroots for those that really need the funding. Because most of our young people really don't want to go into farming. They don't want to go into dirty jobs. Uh, they all seeking for white collar jobs that are not there. And I believe that a call to serve God is not a call to poverty. There's so many things we've neglected in the church here that we believe that with faith, we can get everything. But the scriptures say, faith without work is dead. And so I, I want to use this also to encourage all of us to look beyond just um, the paperwork and look at how practically we can put most of these things into reality. And I want to also say, when we get to the, the, the point of creating this microfinance, I will actually want to get your sincere input in materials and how to do this. Because this has been my hard cry over the years until I did my SBCW. So for as many of you that are into this, uh, it is just beyond the school. God is calling us into a world of transformation. You know, we are in dear, dear, dear need in our country, you know, because so many of those things we neglected are the things that are haunting us now. We have rich land, but people are not, you know, engaged in meaningful farming. So this is what we're trying to do. And uh, we call uh, our body, uh, uh, the organization, AgroBeat, AgroBeat Venture. So we want to redrum the beat of agriculture in our country, Nigeria. So I want to sincerely say thank you. I've, I've been blessed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone from here, I'm share this. Move like a cross. Questions are like patients. Is this what you said? Eh? <coughs> mm. Okay. Uh, there is a question here. So, the question is, uh, is it so important nowadays to involve pastors and local churches uh, in farming? Is the question why that is important or whether it is important? 
Yeah, I said, is it important nowadays uh, to involve pastors and the churches uh, in farming? Well, yes and no. <laughs> uh, yes, in the sense that God has said that the church is baptized with the spirit of truth. The state is not. The individual, the person, is baptized with the Holy Spirit. But the spirit of truth is what the church is being baptized with. So, in my eyes, the, the church needs to become a place that where, where character formation and training is, should be focused. And this is the prerequisite for a well-running cooperative or uh, you know, agricultural business. The, the problem that we've had over the last 200 years so or so is that churches and missions have been teaching only that people need to be converted to Christ and they, then they did a little bit of discipleship maybe then when it went quite well, but the rest of society was left over to the devil to, to speak a little bit bluntly. So business was left to the devil because the church didn't have anything to do with business. Agriculture was left to the devil. The government and the, the leadership of the, of the nation was left to the devil because the church was not interested in government anymore because politics was, was something dirty you don't want to get in touch with. So what happens is you see your nations drifting away from biblical principles and worldview because the church is not discipling the nation anymore, because this is actually what Jesus said. Matthew 28 says, we shall disciple not individuals, but nations, make disciples of nations. So how do we do that? Of course, we do it by teaching. Teaching these things that I've, as an example today, I've been teaching about rifles and cooperatives and things like that. But there's tons of more topics that the church should teach the nation. But the church is so occupied with mission and evangelism and a little bit of discipleship and worship that it doesn't have any time to go into the business and workplace and to go into the government and to go in the legal spaces to teach biblical principles. So in, the, in that sense, the church at large, as not, not only the individual church, but the church in a nation, has a calling to transform that nation. And the church has been neglecting that uh, and it's now getting the 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 the, the, uh, the kind of the the bill for that the, the invoice because the invoice is that nations are becoming godless and not interested in in biblical principles anymore. So, in that sense, the church is rep responsible for overseeing also agriculture because ag agriculture will work best when you have farmers who are taught in integrity who are taught in character, who are formed as good stewards of the soil that they've been entrusted with, uh, who have been taught the principle of sharing with the poor, who have been taught the principles of paying taxes and not bribing, and all of these things, they are generated in the church. Uh, of course, the church does not have the task primarily to, uh, to have um, agriculture. That, that, that's not the main task of the church, of course. So in that sense, no. <laughs> okay. Thank you, that was a great question. Yeah. So from Malawi, just want to appreciate from your teaching and we have again and learn a lot that we may use the biblical view uh, if we want to bring change. And also we may start ourselves, uh, changing ourselves and uh, start with the little we have. So yeah, we are really appreciating that. Thank you so much. Any other additions or comments or questions, or whatever is on your heart?
So my question is, another solution is as well um, often done is, is micro credits or um, so what do you think about that? So to give these micro credits that somebody can start a business, is this um, so just your meaning or your opinion about that? I believe microcredit system is is a very very good system. Uh, I believe we should be careful to not um, give microcredit systems into the hands of Western banks, because that will lead to the fact that they will only be interested in in maximizing their profits. So and that you don't want that. You want your your own microcredit systems. So you can basically create a microcredit system. If you bring the, the 20 people I see there in Malawi SBCW together, and they all put some money into a bank cooperative, and then someone from that group can loan money from that group, a microcredit, and then pay back a small credit for, let's say, a sewing machine or something, can pay back that loan by very small amounts every month. So th that's excellent, an excellent model of uh, what Raiffeisen would love that. I think, <laughs> if you could be here today. So that would be this, this right eyes model. <laughs> but what we do in the world, what we see today is this microcredits coming from the West, somebody who has a lot of money, and then just, um, I don't know exactly the details behind it, but this is often the concept, though, that this is the microcredits working in the world. The micro -credit, yeah, the microcredit system itself is, is very good. I think the, uh, sometimes you have to be careful because the microcredit institutions that, for example, work in Africa, some of them have a political agenda. So they try to push some, some uh, political agenda on you. So they say, if you want to get this microcredit, you have to sign this paper and then you have to adhere to some, you know, um, gender stupidity and stuff like that, which the United Nations require or stuff like that. So you need to be careful because some of them will ask you to sign stuff that you don't want to sign. <laughs> um, so you need to be careful whether you want that or not. So the political agenda behind some of the microcredit institutions uh, needs to be looked at uh, thoroughly because some of them have, so have some ideological agenda connected to them because um, yeah, see, for example, Uganda has received a lot of money from uh, from from the United States uh, U.S. aid, and when Uganda decided to to um, um, propose a law that uh, caused homosexuality to be a not legally accepted form of um, partnering between two men or two women. Then the U.S. aid started stopping uh, monies flowing, and that happens all the time. So, when when you have when you when you adhere to biblical principles uh, and rules, you will get into trouble with some of the the, the financing institutions. Uh, of course, that that's not nice, but that's the way it is. So, you need to make sure that you don't get into some trouble with ideological uh, ideas behind some of the banking. Um, banking partners that do microfinancing. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I have I have more questions, and nobody asked some. <laughs> so the question is also, I mean, for all for the Western, but also for Africans and I think Indians. I mean, the state is uh, pay a lot of money, let's say, for agriculture. It would not function in Germany, in Switzerland, when not the pay, uh, when not the state will pay a lot. And also in Africa, I mean in Malawi, I know the debate about the fertilizer, the price is going up, they cannot afford the fertilizer, and therefore they have no harvest. Because they they they, they think that the state have to pay them, otherwise they cannot do a harvest. So this system, or I think it's a, it's a wrong idea behind it, but how, how do you see that? Or what has to be changed? 
I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly because you're so far from the microphone. I hear it a little bit, but not so well. <laughs> so okay, where is the microphone? <laughs> Okay. No, just the, the, the money that is paid from the state that the farming can run in Germany, Switzerland, but also in Africa. I mean, they they say Malawi or they cannot do farming because they don't have the fertilizer from the state and that it's too expensive to buy it by themselves. So actually, the it's a lot of of farming is is um. Is only possible because the state is paying a lot of money. So what do you say to that? I think that's not true, actually. It's just, it's it's one of these, um, you don't have to wait until, you know, the government gives you money for fertilizer. Um, because if, you know, if I can get you in contact with my friend Dan Jansen, who has been doing farming all over Africa for the last 30 years, and he says, you don't need these fertilizers because the African ground in most of the places for some, with some exceptions, of course, um, is so fertile and you can use it. Uh, you can almost do anything um, and you can even solve problems with, um, you know, um, uh, plagues or, 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 um, uh, or fungi or other problems that you may have. Uh, with natural uh, and, and biological weapons, kind of, he says, that th there, there are solutions out there. And it's just one of the excuses that people put out to say, I can't do this, I can't do that, um, because I have to wait until. No, you don't. Y you can't. So if you need, uh, there are networks of, of Christian, um, biblically thinking farmers who will be able to assist you, like my friend Dan Jansen, who is just one of many of them. Uh, the CSS Farming School in Nigeria, for example, is, is doing an excellent job at, at this. Um, Professor Vincent Anikbogo is one of the teachers in that um, school. Um, so they are all applying principles that don't need the expensively to be, buy, to be bought uh, fertilizers and all that stuff. You can get around that without. Yes, I would like to comment on when you said about this um, mindset, can do mindset and I think it's very helpful. It's it's hopeful and it's very biblical also. So thank you for bringing this. Look at this pretty place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so. Any more questions or clarifications from the other places there? It is. Okay, uh, if not, uh, uh, we can uh, close this Zoom mm -hmm. session time. Okay, Andreas, thank you so much. Uh, we are so grateful for all the teaching that you have given to all of us. And I'm sure uh, the ones who are over Zoom also have had a good time. So thank you. It's time to say bye bye to everyone on Zoom. Bye bye. Goodbye and thank you so much for taking the time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so bye. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.